Fungus. Atkins. Chocolate chip. France. You what? So as far as I've seen, the fan reaction to episode 3 of The Last of Us splits into two camps. One is that people find the episode wonderful and heartbreaking in all the best ways, and the other is that people find it to be unnecessary filler that diverged from the tone and added nothing to the plot. I think everyone who played the game was a little bit disappointed not to see the dynamic between Ellie and Bill, but based on those two camps, people either forgave that to support a greater story or added it to their list of grievances. Personally, Personally, I think this episode contributed a hell of a lot to the story, and that's precisely because this isn't just a one episode love story of two side characters, there's much more to this which means it packs such a heavy thematic punch in a way I've not seen being discussed much. Sure, it doesn't contribute a huge deal to the plot specifically, but plot and story are separate things. You can get, like a lot of films that are very plot heavy with all sorts of stuff constantly happening, but the impact and meaning of all those twists and turns can easily become unfulfilling and a bit repetitive. Whereas I think everything that happens in this episode will make everything that happens later on matter much more, so that's what I wanted to discuss today. If you want you can check out my video on episodes 1 and 2 of this show, and though I normally don't ask mid-video, please do like and comment if you want me to continue this series, because I do feel a bit unsure at the moment. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's just get into this. The thing I find most interesting about the dynamic between Bill and Frank is that despite Bill being Mr. Survivalist with all the guns and the know-how, despite this being his town he built for himself, Frank is almost immediately the more active in charge one of the two. You know, in no time at all he's stepping away from the dining table to play the piano, he's then getting Bill to sing, then initiating a kiss, telling him to go and shower so they can have sex. He's the one wanting to do up other parts of the town to invite in other people he's met through the radio, leading them on runs, setting up the surprise of strawberries, and laying out the plan for his final day. Which isn't to say that's all about control, and it isn't to say they aren't still equals, you know, Bill is clearly in charge of all the resources and defences, Frank has to ask him to borrow petrol and paint and things, but nonetheless, it's interesting because when I think about the type of people who do prepare for a possible doomsday, as Bill did well before the outbreak ever occurred, I feel like control must be an important factor in that, to look at your current life where you might feel a little powerless, lacking in agency, possibly isolated, and instead fantasise about some future apocalypse. That's going to change things, then I'll be on top, everyone else will be left reeling or dying, and I'll not just have power exactly, but total control over my own life. The dream for that, which might somewhat be a fantasy, but it also becomes the literal reality here for Bill. He owns an entire town, there's no one there to stop him doing what he wants, no one to mess up the way he likes things being, and no one he has to be responsible for. And yet despite living this dream he'd been preparing for for years, we spend the entire episode watching him then relinquish a lot of that control. Here's Frank to come in and mess up the way Bill likes things being. Sometimes that's exciting, like leading Bill through his first nervous experience in bed with a man. Sometimes it's frustrating, like doing up all these other shops, or inviting in Tess and Joel when he's fiercely against that. And Bill's montage at the start does all look fun, and I'm sure it's exactly what Americans think the rest of the world see them like, but um, it all dies down into a quiet moment. Bill sits and eats his food around a very small table boxed in by this tight shadow on one side and the door frame to the next room on the other. Makes him look very cramped and claustrophobic and lonely. And then when Frank's invited in for food, they sit at a much larger table in a better lit room with windows and a much wider space. Instead of being boxed in by the door frame now, it provides an opening outwards for them, welcoming them into this next room where they then find the piano and then kiss. Beneath this layer of idealised American dream, self-sufficient safety and control, Bill is 
desperately lonely. He's been entirely on his own for four years. As much as he is guarded and wary of letting Frank in, it takes very little persuasion. And all Frank's asking for is a simple meal to then send him on his way. That's all that's expected. But no, Bill pulls out all of the stops here for this man he's known like 10 minutes. Giving him a hot shower, finding him new fresh clothes, setting out a full-blown fine dining experience complete with the perfect choice of wine and the offer of more if he's still hungry. Bill can't help wanting to impress this strange man who he doesn't even trust yet, hence the gun he takes to the table. He can't help wanting to impress him, you see it in his bashful response to Frank's compliments. Everything tastes good when you're starving. Yeah, but... Not like this. It's funny really, you know, it, it's so easy for any of us to feel a bit out of control in our lives, lacking some agency, power, feeling like we're drifting along, perhaps even a bit emasculated, which is a complete stab in the dark, but that could be part of why Bill had such an obsession with survivalism to begin with. Picking something a bit stereotypically masculine to almost compensate for how he might feel, I suppose. Could be wrong there, but, but the point is, any of us might yearn for a bit more control in our lives and yet when Bill gets that, the thing he's wanted, what he learns then is how vibrant and exciting it is to not have total control, to have someone who challenges you, pulls you in new directions, stretches you out past your comfort zone as Frank does for him time and time again. Not just exciting though, also meaningful, Frank becomes Bill's entire purpose, the whole point of surviving in the first place, not just for ego, not just to feed this feeling of mastery, but to protect and look after something he cares for beyond himself, someone that can impact him as much as he can impact them. I was never afraid before you showed up. I saved him, then I protected him. That's why men like you and me are here. We have a job to do. A meaning, a purpose so absolute for Bill that once this job is done, he feels there's no life left. And I think all of that is very, very interesting when we then look at the dynamic between Joel and Ellie. So let's jump to that now. But first. Uh, I've been staring at this the whole time. You know how much these are worth? Hello world! Have you heard of World Anvil? World? <laughs> <laughs> sponsoring this video. World Anvil is an online tool for world building, character creation, campaign building and playing in all of these games. Planning and writing your stories and possibly some other stuff. I just use it for my novel but it does other stuff too. World building can be difficult you know. I used to use a folder for different word documents which seemed simple enough to begin with until things get complex and you end up with a disorganized mess and you suddenly wish you had hyperlinks to different characters characters or mythologies in your notes or imagine this say you want to design your own calendar for your world you can pop in all the information have the calendar generated then build a timeline of historical events linked to that calendar or several calendars with all sorts of hyperlinks you might want sprawling to other articles and then upload a map and link different events to locations on the map so you can easily see where and when everything happened. I find that so handy. And if the timeline affects how the map looks, such as a big city getting destroyed or whatever else, you can add altered maps to reflect those changes. And there are other tools as well. This is just the one I find most exciting, especially when it is all surprisingly easy to set up. In all my use of World Anvil so far, I haven't ever bothered to watch any of their tutorials on how to do stuff. I've just got on with it. I have a link in the description and as a pinned comment with the code TREE which offers you 40% off all their subscriptions. There are different levels and you can even try out the free version initially so give it a whirl, take it for a test drive. World Anvil, now me back to talking other things. But yeah, Joel needing complete control at all times. Rule 3. You do what I say when I say it. Joel not relinquishing some of that the way Bill does, not letting Ellie make any decisions or impact who he is, impact his heart, no. Joel was like that with Tess somewhat. He never fully let himself care for her, despite beginning this episode laying stones for Tess. I, I never ask you for anything not to feel the way I felt. Letting people in means getting hurt when you lose them, and also the idea of failure. It's not Joel's fault, but Twice now he feels he's failed to protect others. Bill's letter reaffirms the idea that Joel has failed to protect Tess, and it 
hurts. He responds to this sense of failure by now insisting even more so on having all the control in his relationship with Ellie. Otherwise, what if he suffers failure again? Repeat it. What you say goes. I don't think I've worded that point the best, but it's to say that Joel learns the complete wrong message from what Bill's character arc is supposed to tell him. Bill desired control through his doomsday future in order to feel more mastery, then slowly relinquishes some of that control for love. He was always a protector, and we need some control in order to protect others, but what's the point in doing that if there's nothing worth protecting? What's the point in protecting someone you don't care about if you just see them as cargo? So we've got that on the one hand, and then on the other, Joel, who had actually been slowly relinquishing a little control in this episode. Like, he's not wanted to, but Ellie finds her ways, like choosing which path to walk even when Joel says no, and stealing the gun without Joel seeing. Slowly, she starts to gain a little bit more control in their relationship until Joel reacts against all of this at the end of the episode and says, no, what I say goes, I demand that. So then, desiring control partly is a reaction against his grief and against the fear of repeatedly failing others he was meant to protect. He ends this episode then somewhat on the opposite trajectory to Bill and I think that's then going to catapult him into the next episode much more demanding and controlling until it really gets to Ellie and she pushes back and all of it will then come to a head around the idea of her stealing that gun. Let's go a little further though because there are some things you just can't control. Sarah's death was not Joel's fault no matter how much he might feel like it was. Tess's death wasn't his fault. We can't control death, and that's painful. And I think we see that idea culminating here with Bill realising there is a point where he can no longer protect Frank, where he's not supposed to protect him anymore. He has to let go and let Frank do what he's decided to do. Bill is forced to have no control or choice in what Frank decides, and my god that would hurt. I do actually think it is a bit much of Frank springing that on him, you know, suddenly deciding today is going to be his final day. Surely you should discuss it well in advance to give both of you time to grieve and talk things through. I reckon we are supposed to have conflicted feelings about that, I think Bill most certainly does. But if Bill's entire purpose of living was to protect Frank, so much so that there's no point to living once he's gone, how might that be foreshadowing for Joel and Ellie? You know, say Joel does come to care a great deal about Ellie, say protecting her does become his purpose too, what happens then when the job is over? When they reach this laboratory and he has to say goodbye to her, will he too let her go as Frank asked Bill to do, or will he not? Will Joel refuse to and instead seize control there? Control I guess over what happens with the rest of Ellie's life? It could go either way, it's too early to know what to expect of the Fireflies, but it does make this whole episode great foreshadowing. The many confusing ways the idea of control fits into ideas around love. I was going to talk about Fedra this video, and how much there's mention of the government all being Nazis, how Fedra would kill innocent, healthy people because dead people can't be infected. And again, all of the questions this show raises about the extreme measures of control needed to keep others safe. How Fedra might then reflect Joel's attitude of what I say goes. When are those measures too extreme? When is it less protective? protecting others than holding them back? When is the control more for your own desires than for their needs? All questions that are going to become increasingly important as this story progresses. A lot of the groundwork for that is laid in this episode, and even if not everybody notices that and just sees this episode as filler, it will still be there unconsciously, and will mean what might happen later down the line will be more impactful as a result. Or so I'm assuming, you know, <laughs> who knows where this is going next. They were clearly unafraid to switch up the source material for this episode, and for what that achieves, I really appreciate it. And if you appreciated this video, leave a like, leave your thoughts, good or bad, subscribe if you want more of this stuff, or any of the other things I do on this channel. Pop over to Patreon if you want to help support me. A big thank you to World Anvil again, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Janice McMahon, Blue Core, Treat You Caber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Flying Spider, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Folliette, and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.